All right, this is 4.2, day four continued. We're still talking about experiments, and in particular, uh, blocking within experiments. So we're going to start here at example two, the microwave popcorn. Uh, it says, a popcorn lover wants to know if it is better to use the popcorn button on our microwave oven or use the amount of time recommended on, the pop on the, just the bag of popcorn. Kind of an interesting, yet still easy idea. You know, some uh, microwaves that you might use, they have just a popcorn button, you throw in the bag and you press the popcorn button. Is that more effective than you following the directions on the bag of popcorn and cooking it for a certain amount of time? Okay, so it says to measure how well each method works, she will count the number of unpopped kernels remaining after popping. She goes to the store and buys 10 bags each of four different varieties of popcorn, movie butter, light butter, natural, and kettle corn for a total of 40 bags. And the first part here just says explain why a randomized block design might be preferable to a completely randomized design for this experiment. Um, right away I'm thinking in particular she wants to run this experiment not just for like one single type of popcorn but for multiple types of popcorn so if we can compare those types directly to themselves that might be a reason to use blocking in this example. So if it was just completely random we just randomly assign those bags to treatments, what's the issue with that? Uh, well, a completely randomized design would just ignore the differences between the four types of popcorn. It's pretty, pretty reasonable to think that uh, different types of popcorn might cook differently. So we have to use some stats terminology when we say why it's better to do a randomized block design. And there's a really key phrase in this one. So what would a randomized block design do? So if we block by the type of popcorn, that would decrease variability. That would decrease variability in the number of unpopped kernels. Because it accounts for each type of popcorn. So we aren't going to see uh, a, a great amount of variability just because we had different types. If we look at each type separately, if we block by type, and we look at the unpopped, like we compare them to their own, um, their own brand or their own type, then we won't, like we won't be subject to all the variability that comes with doing a totally randomized design. So what we'll look for in AP stats, the randomized block design in this case would decrease variability that might be caused by looking at the different types of popcorn. Um, if you didn't look at them separately, that would cause a lot more variability. So we decrease variability by using that block design. Okay, so the second part here just says outline a randomized block design for this experiment. So how would we go about setting up an experiment that would actually use those blocks that would account for the different types of popcorn? So she has 10 bags of each kind. There's four different kinds. So to be fair, if there's 10 bags of each kind, we should randomly assign bags. Like for each kind, randomly assign five bags to each treatment. And how do you do that? You could say the hat method. I mean, for practical purposes, why don't we just say put all 10 bags in a large grocery bag, mix well, draw them out, and randomly assign them to treatments. So it's still really important to randomize in this, this experiment. It's still really important to randomly assign to treatments. Um, that typically takes care of, you know, we get all the different, like say we got one good bag, one bad bag. If we're randomly assigning, it takes care of those um, naturally occurring phenomena. So in doing that, we randomly select five bags to be popped using the popcorn button. The remaining five, they're going to be popped using just the instructions on the bag. And a lot of times kids stop right here. They're like, oh great, I figured out how to randomly assign it. I told you where they're going to go for the two treatments, but then they just stop. Um, okay, that's great. Now tell me what you're going to observe, what you're going to compare. So we're looking for, for each of the bags, what are we going to do when we run our experiment? After we pop it, we're going to count the number of unpopped kernels. That's going to be a measurement of how well it did in the microwave, no matter which treatment it got. 
So we're going to count the number of unpopped kernels after we follow the directions or use the microwave button, whichever one we do. That's going to be our measurement of how well or how not well it did. And the last thing we need to mention, and this is probably the most often forgot, like, great job. You did the experiment. You know what you're looking for. But why are you doing the experiment in the first place? What are you going to do at the conclusion when you get done? Well, you're simply going to compare the results, right? Compare results among the four types. And at that step, you can say, you know, which type does well, which type doesn't do well, popcorn button versus, you know, instructions on the back. So the last step, we just compare the results. Uh, we, already, we already counted the unpopped kernels. And for your enjoyment, I save a little room here for the baby meme about popcorn. So there you go. I'm a popcorn button man myself. So then you don't have to read the instructions. So now let's, let's refer back to that caffeine experiment. The next page says, what are some variables that we can block for in the caffeine experiment? In general, how can we determine which variable might be best for blocking? Okay, so there's a lot of different factors uh, that would go into how caffeine might affect you. Um, you could probably come up with multiple. I'm thinking, you know, maybe your age. Old guys like me, they seem to drink more caffeine. It doesn't affect them as much. Kids, you've never had caffeine before. Um, that's going to affect you a lot more. Maybe uh, your weight, your body mass, your typical caffeine, your typical caffeine consumption. Right? Maybe you built up some sort of tolerance to caffeine, like I have. So there's multiple things to consider blocking for within the caffeine experiment. What would be the best variable for blocking? How do you choose it? In general, which variable is going to be the best predictor of your response? So the best variables for blocking are the ones that best predict the response. If you ask me for a specific one, I'd probably do this one, the typical caffeine consumption. But if everybody's pretty much the same on typical caffeine consumption, then we might want to consider blocking on something else. So that'd be great if we could identify the best predictor of the response variable and we could block on that. All right, so the last part to these notes, uh, we have a new vocab term here, um, and it's a part of blocking for experiments. It says, what is a match pairs design here in italics? So I drew a little arrow here. We're going to start by the definition. So a match pairs design, what is that? It's a randomized block experiment. It's actually just a small one. It's a little mini one in which each block consists of a matching pair. Pair you're thinking of two, I hope. So it's got a matching pair of similar experimental units. Experimental units is just a fancy way to say like subjects, like people in an experiment. If they're not people, though, we don't call them subjects. We call them experimental units. So it's a specific case for a block design. There's only two of them. They're a similar pair. Uh, and we have chance. Chance is used to determine which unit in each pair gets each treatment. So that's actually really familiar. We know how important it is to randomly assign treatments. So you randomly assign. There's only two, like two people or two units in the pair. You randomly assign the treatment to one or the other. Sometimes a pair in a matched pair's design consists of a single unit, like, for example, I myself could be the only unit, but I could receive both treatments. Like I could be in a taste test, the experiment, I tried Coke and Pepsi, so that would be like a matched pair's design. I'm the only unit and I try both treatments. That, that's another form of matched pairs. Since the order can influence the response, think about Coke or Pepsi, chance is used, like randomly assigning the treatment order to see which treatment goes first for each unit. The other way we use matched pairs, um, if you know people that are twins, they're really interesting for experiments because they're so similar. Um, we can randomly assign a treatment to each one and see what the effect is. So matched pairs design, hence the word pairs in the name, is a special case of a randomized block experiment. So could we use a match pairs design. 
Oh, right here. Don't go to the activity just yet. We're going to do that in class. Could we use a mesh pairs design for the caffeine experiment? So could we either uh, put people into really similar pairs or somehow take each individual and give them two different types of treatments? That would actually prove to be pretty difficult, I think, uh, with the caffeine experiment. So uh, we either need enough, enough pairs of similar individuals or we randomly assign both treatments to the same person, but it would have to be on different days because the treatments would obviously not be independent. They would influence each other. So I think the, like to find pairs of similar people, that would be really difficult and really not very practical, and our results really wouldn't be worth a whole lot. It would be more, I think, practical to do maybe different days give the treatments. Again, you couldn't do caffeine treatments on the same day because they would no longer be independent. They would absolutely uh, be influencing each other. All right, so another great uh, vocab term, match pairs design. Two, uh, two similar individuals or one person getting both treatments. So think of the number two in pairs, match pairs design. And that is all for these notes. I'll see you in class.